taking the time to listen and diagnose the kind of the actual root of the problem was something that has, has certainly worked quite well for us. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I had the great pleasure of speaking with Alex Scott Whitby, founder of Scott Whitby Studio, an award-winning architecture and urban design practice based in London. Alex is currently leading projects that range from a maypole on the Strand to a large private house in Riyadh, from a public space in Winchester to a new square outside St Paul's Cathedral. Alex is passionate about education. He combines leading Scott Whitby Studio with being an admissions tutor and senior lecturer at the University of East London. Previously, he was a unit master at the Architectural Association, a visiting lecturer at the Welsh School of Architecture and a visiting professor at the International University of Architecture in Venice. Alex's interest in the future of the profession saw him sit on the RABA Council for 10 years, during which time he sat on the board of the British British Architectural Trust, as well as education, membership and international relations committees, and was a member of the British Architectural Library Committee. He first studied architecture in Newcastle, uh, after which he spent a number of years working in advertising and filmmaking, after which he completed his studies in the free unit at the Cass School of Architecture London. He has won many awards and honours for his work, and the work of the studio has been exhibited and published internationally. In 2016, he was named by the ROBA Journal as one of the rising stars of British architecture. In today's episode, we will be discussing slow architecture, what this is and how it can work in business the art of listening and being a doctor of space which is one of alex's philosophies around architecture and working intimately with clients and we also discuss some of the challenges and the benefits of working internationally in places such as the middle east and russia so sit back relax and enjoy alex scott whitby this podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Alex, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? I'm well, thank you again for having me. I'm kind of looking forward to having, a, you know, having this conversation. My absolute pleasure. Um, so I'm very excited to be speaking with you. You're the uh, founder of Scott Whitby Studio. You're also a, an educator, a teacher, and you have a teaching practice at uh, University East London. Um, you've done some extraordinary projects recently. You've got a portfolio of work which kind of spans the globe. Um, recently, I know the project. Well, actually, I was on I was on a judging panel for a certain competition recently, and one of your beautiful projects came up the Jubilee the Jubilee Pool, um, which is you know an amazing community led driven project. Um, so you know it's you're a you're a young vibrant practice doing incredible design work and looking at your CV you know I, I, I'm often always curious at this jump when I see somebody who's come straight from university and then gone straight into business either it's kind of part craziness or part massive ambition what what was the story how come you started the, the practice so quickly after your education it's a good question I think I had a number of opportunities to think about what I wanted to do at that at that juncture and actually I had a offer to go work for a number of different practices when I left university and I'd also just entered a competition for which I you know when you enter competitions when you're young and kind of thinking oh, I'm going to just enter it and it was an, an open competition had and we found out there were 150 entries to this competition it's called the ROBA open spaces competition and um, expecting nothing of it, um, going down the route of right. Actually, let's um, let's go do the do the traditional route. Let's work work in practice. And I got we were kind of amazed. I went to this event 
and didn't dress up properly and have really <laughs> badly dressed at this event. And as the event, as the kind of the, the, they went from like 12th prize and they went up and they were, you know, we we're all in the room. And we, um, and at the last moment, I kind of, kind of reached over to a friend of mine and said, well, it's either nothing or first. And the name got called out and first, and there I was badly dressed and won first prize in this competition, beating Stanton Williams to that prize. Amazing. And that prize kind of gave us a small amount of funding, like gave mm-hmm. us a kind of £5,000 prize fund. But what it really did was get the, this was the project where we were looking, it was a student project we started with, which was to get, to take 38 of the 51 church spires in the city of London and turn them into low rent creative studios for artists. Um, and I had test, done the, a test of concept by being the first person I'd, I'd persuaded using my day as a student as could I come and inhabit the church spire. So I had his office in the spire of St. Mary Walnut, Hawksmoor's gem at the overlooking bank station. And I was shivering in this church spire, very, very <laughs> cold, but uh, kind of working out of this, this eerie, in essence. And um, out of that, and the vicar came to me after hearing we'd won this competition and the other press that came about it and said, well, you've got to really do this now. This can't just be a hypothetical thing. You've got to start like making this happen. And so we were able to kind of kind of leverage ourselves, ourselves in some ways off this project to commit to the idea of kind of seeing if we could get other churches in the city and turn them into low rent studio spaces. And, and what was lovely about that project wasn't us actually in the end designing those studio spaces ourselves, but it was mm-hmm. actually the idea that other people saw the I saw this kind of this was possible and went off and did it themselves. So we thought it was gonna be this great thirty year project where we were gonna kind of design thirty eight church spires in the city of London, but actually it ended up being a kind of an instigator, a, a creative way of thinking about space. Mm. And that as a studio, I suppose, we kept on the idea of being kind of kind of creative instigators, I suppose, creative kind of trying to help people, clients, actually the profession, think more differently about what architecture could be, I suppose, mm-hmm. at that point, yeah. and at that very beginning moment in the practices kind of evolution. That's a very interesting uh, idea as well and, and kind of positions the architect, not just being someone who always is the one delivering the idea, but one is someone who is a generator and a purveyor of ideas. Um, and kind of, you know, we forget that sometimes that that's actually part and parcel of the role of the architect is to speculate about how spaces can be used. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily need to be the ones that are, that are, that are doing it. And this is a kind of communication arm of, of running your own practice. Once you, once you had that, that kind of idea up and running, what were the next sorts of projects that kind of started to give the business a bit of a belly? Well, we, we started off with some kind of, we were. We kind of started working on a project with um, Little Boots, who's this uh, a singer-songwriter, and she's actually now working with Abba, a musician, and we did the tiny project with, with her to kind of look at her house and her space outside her house, which was kind of a really interesting kind of early project, kind of early in. Then we ended up working with a photographer, looking at his house, and um, again, actually through those positions. And, and then we had this incredible client who was an amazing lady called Lisa Page, and she is this, and actually she's a, in 2023 as we are now to be thinking about a lady who, this was, you know, back in 2011, who took a chance on a super young practice. She'd seen the kind of work we were doing and kind of thinking differently about, and she came to us with, and they basically gave us tiny, small little idea, um, kind of dream projects. Like we were, she was the, um, she was organizing an event called the Alliance Ball. And the Alliance Ball was this incredible, it was kind of 10 years, it was kind of four or five years into it, it was a ball that was set up by UNICEF, for UNICEF. And the, the aim of it was to raise a million pounds for charity and through the construction industry. It was set up by Stanhope and Lendley. And we were, and she kind of came to us and said, well, would you like to, we want, we need a, some sort of sculptural intervention in the welcome space of this ball. And so we went off and made the world's longest table out of a single continuous ribbon of material. For instance, this was a kind of idea of, you know, making a, we worked with this with a company called Swift Horseman to make a table that kind of was kind of something like 130 meters long, but was made out of three mil thick kind of plywood that would kind of ribbon over and create a space in the kind of structure around it. Right. And that Lisa never, 
has never not been a client of the studio, which is lovely. You know, these kind of tiny, small things that weren't always architecture. You know, we were asked at one point to do a, Lisa asked us to make a lighting installation for the opening, uh, the, the kind of, um, the topping out ceremony for the Bloomberg building. So we made a lighting installation that was up for a couple of days that would then come down afterwards, which was a, you know, over a bar that would give significance. So she, she was an amazing client who kind of, and this still is an amazing client who kind of gives us, who's, who kind of will always, always comes back and has this kind of crazy idea of a project and a piece. And, and also I think, well, nicely became a friend. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, architecture, what's is a, we are in a professional world. The world is profession is, you know, we have to act as professionally, you know, we need our clients to become friends and you yeah. know, to, to have trust. And I think for me, the trust thing is so important in architecture and in, in a way the work we do from the, the kind of very quick, small scale things, right up to the things that take a really, really long time, it's all about having trust in people. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, architects are in a way we're doctors of space. Yeah. We, we train, you know, we train for as long as a doctor to become people who can help people who have helped clients and help communities and people who have kind of real serious problems with their space. You know, we aren't, you know, and that's what we can do. We can help people kind of make change and make their spaces better for the future. How do you um, go about attracting and liaising and finding these kinds of interesting clients who are willing to let you, you know, uh, engage with, with quite experimental or alternative types of projects? You know, they're projects that, you know, not your typical client would um, typically be commissioning? Um, it's a really good question. I think 90% of our work comes through recommendation. Right. Comes through people. And it's, it's one of the, again, it's about the community of people around us. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the most heartening things we've, we've found is that people really are coming to us because they get, someone says something really great about, about what we've been doing with them or the way we work. And, you know, we don't work in a, we aren't, you know, we, we do pitch for work a lot and we are kind of doing the eyes or, or collaborating with other, with other kind of architecture practices as well on projects. Now a lot we work, we collaborate a lot with Graham Massey architects um, on urban realm and public realm projects, but um, the vast majority of our work comes through a recommend, through recommendations. So, you know, through Lisa and um, Paige, we got a recommend that we were put on a short list to work with um to do a project for um the Simon community which was a which is London's oldest homeless community and the, this was a this was and the, the Bloomberg project were going to help fund that project mm. um so they got a choice of which architect to choose and we were on that short list and we were recommended to do that project and then through that project the trustee um or the planning consultant of the of for the Simon community from DP9 happened to be a trustee of Westminster Chapel. And we were asked at the beginning to come in and he kind of said, oh, we've got a problem with the toilet. And um, we, you know, and it was literally, can we put an extra toilet into Westminster Chapel? And that was like six years ago. And we walked in and saw this space and it's genuinely a space that made my, the, the hairs in my neck kind of, kind of tingle and kind of set, stand up on end. And kind of went, well, we can do, we did the work. We said that we, this is how you could do it without a toilet. And we did that, you know, at, you know, high to low cost or, you know, almost for free, but we, cause it wasn't a kind of, we didn't see that problem. We said, but we think it's not the toilet that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So we ended up kind of, um, and then worked slowly with that process of looking at the project. And yeah, that was, um, yeah, so it always, it seems that these projects always kind of something kind of rolls on to the next thing, which has yeah. always been which is a great joy in a way. Um, mm. But yeah. I, I, I like this idea, what you're saying, that architects are, are doctors of space mm. and you're kind of sticking with that analogy, you know, and, and certainly from a business perspective, um, we'll often always talk about, you know, marketing is, you know, you're trying to understand people's pains and their problems. Mm. How do you, how do you, or how do you help your clients determine whether they're ill or not? I think the first thing we do is we listen to them. Um, my wife's a clinical psychologist, and I'm right. really lucky to have someone whose job it is is to is to through talking therapy and listening, um, kind of. And I've that's whatever I think she what she does is definitely rubs off on the process of 
whiteboard I'm doing. So we tend to listen first before we do any drawing. So it's quite difficult. It's probably why we don't win lots of kind of EOIs. We, we're fairly good at competitions, but why we don't mm-hmm. win lots of these things, because everyone wants you to come up with, what are you going to do for me? And we go in with, well, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to listen to you. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to listen. We're going to help diagnose mm-hmm. something. So actually with, with Westminster Chapel, with the GB pool, with um, the project we're working on at the moment, the church house in Westminster, we started those projects with residency. We actually moved the office into those spaces so in, in, and worked out of those buildings to get to know the buildings and the people better and listen and learn from those places. So by the end of those residencies, we could diagnose the some of the key issues that they had because we, we weren't just coming in looking at it from a desktop study. We were actually inhabiting those spaces. The first project I, one of the first projects we did was working with a client for the Six Pillars um, house up in Dulwich. It's a right. Lebetkin house. And I was super young and I was really, really scared to do any proper design work on the house. I'm totally honest. It was like, you know, you get given a Lebetkin house in Dulwich and you're like, I know I'm going to muck this up kind of thing. You know, how can I do this? I'm not, you know. I don't want to touch it. Yeah. So, so, but what we did actually, she it was for a family who was a barrister and a, and a, actually my old art teacher from my primary, my secondary school. And she, um, they were living in this house. And we got the kids to do video diaries of what they were doing around the house. And what she needed was what she wanted, what my old art teacher wanted was a space to get away from the kids running around her feet. And we worked out that all she needed to do was put a bookcase in a door and lock a door. And she could have that room in, in the house in the plan because the kids were running around and around and around in circles around this Lebetkin inspired kind of free plan house. And those kind of things where we were listening, learning, and not saying, not going and saying, we're going to spend 250,000 pounds on designing an extension for you for the house, which is what you think you need, but actually mm-hmm. taking the time to listen and diagnose the kind of the actual root of the problem um, was something that has, has certainly worked quite well for us. Mm-hmm. It does mean we are slower, I think, than a lot of um, people, but I would hope that it means that the results that come out people generally feel as if it's the you know the right the right solution i I, I like i definitely like this kind of idea of bringing in some of the clinical psychology Mm. um moves if you like to being able to help open up a client and listen and understand at a very a deeper level what's actually needed and i do think this is this is one of the real powers of an architect is when we're actually not trying to solve something so quickly or solve the problem that the client thinks they have because often they don't, and actually go through this process of helping the, co- the client discover what their real problem is. Yeah. Um, what, what does it look like for you guys? I mean, how do you, what does, it, what does a, a, a kind of a process look like when you first meet a client? How many meetings do you have? What kind of questions do you ask? Well, I think, I think that, first, that first bit of work, and I think we're getting more into it, is this idea of residency. And right. we talk about very early on the idea that, you know, we don't want to just have a set of, you know, define meetings. We actually want to come in and spend some time in the building. You know, whether it's a week or two weeks, it normally works quite well to have a whole cycle of time. So mm-hmm. you are able to really see the difference between one Monday and the next Monday, or a period of we'll move, we'll move a, 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 the team basically that's going to work on that project into that space for a short bit of time, and um, and then in a way that you that also helps you build a lot of trust. So by being there every day, that people popping in and you asking questions and basically being given the keys to kind of wander around a bit, you know, that, that offers a, an ability to do that. So we start, we kind of start there with an idea of kind of listening, learning. We are, all, of course, always drawing and kind of using our architectural skills to kind of help, you know, diagnose issues or problems, be it you know, in certain cases, it can even just be the paint color. Like with Westminster Chapel, the place was painted in magnolia and painted in a magnolia paint for um, 30 years that had got grubby and murky. And mm-hmm. it was either the magnolia paint was going to go or I was going to go. So, we, you know, those <laughs> kind of questions of, you know, it, so we kind of ended up in that world of um, kind of, we there were things we realized um, that needed to change. And and then again, to not just say these are things that are going to change, but to, to work with a client to say, well, actually, does this, does the, are we, do you need this to change? Is this the right thing that you want to change? And having those kind of incremental conversations 
um, who is important. Mm. And then, yes, you do go into this, the cycle of um, meetings, of bi-weekly meetings and weekly meetings, if you kind of work through the, the process and the work. We, we tend to, I think, kind of for us as a practice, we tend to talk a lot about the feasibility project, the feasibility mm-hmm. study, that early study of work where we are, um, which isn't a, a, a typical stage zero. It's kind of probably pre pre feasibility, which is kind of yeah. a visioning study, a kind of a looking at what could happen after the residency, and then that helps set out a scope for the feasibility study, and then writing the brief, and then kind of and then into the concept design. I think so. We kind of I think there's a we could probably take it even earlier than that, which is you know what are the problems? How yeah. do we listen and being kind of cognitive of those things. So, so this this kind of residency or immersive listening type of process that you have is is this related to what you call slow architecture? Yeah, I think so, and I think it's related to the idea that it, you know it, it, to to cook a really good stew, you need really good ingredients, mm-hmm. and I think um, and then actually you need to cook the stew for the right amount of time. There's something about the perfect you know um, beef bourguignon takes four and a half hours to cook. And if you cook it for three and a half hours, it's undercooked. And if you cook it for more, it's overcooked. And, mm-hmm. you know, you need those ingredients. And I think, and I think you, our, our industry is all about relationships. And I think the relationships that we build, not just the relationships with um, the clients, but also really importantly, the stakeholders and the communities around that um, is something that you, you know, you, you can't get on the first meeting. And, you know, well, certainly I can't, maybe others can, but I, I find that ability to engage and build an emotional kind of relationship, emotional kind of intelligence and emotional relationships with people is really important. And I, you know, I think architects have had quite a bad rep at being the people who just don't listen. And I think I am really think that we need to slow down and really listen to people. You know, yeah. architects will in a lot of community consultation that happens at the moment is oh we're kind of listening aren't we we look at us pat, pat, pat mama back we're listening actually they're not really listening they're not really mm-hmm. engaging and then you go into the conversations with communities and they come back to you and they'll go but but you know we talked about all these things and you, you where's it where is it i suppose mm-hmm. we're very keen that well, that, we really that's, want to... that's such an interesting idea as well that there's you know there's the you can do the actions of looking like you're listening but still not be listening and then any kind of report or when I speak with people on client side their concerns and obviously um that that kind of article that was written by that whoever it was Charles what's his face in the time yeah yeah. Yeah, you know that was very kind of sort of inflammatory but it was kind of poking on this idea that the architect doesn't listen and that's sort of um stereotyped cliche idea that we have to like as architects we've got to be responsible for because mm. it's come from somewhere we know it's not true and there's many many architects who are, who are fabulous listeners but actually what you're what you're saying is that the 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 art of listening properly and deeply to the client and and so that they feel that they've been listened to yeah is actually is actually very special yeah and i think and i think it's really important because i think you, we we don't only have to listen. I think the listening to the client is super important and very much so. But we also have to listen to the site mm. and to the history of those places. So the heritage that we walk into, we have to listen to both those pieces. And you know, there's always the you know the, our duty of care is to if we aren't artists. Our duty of care is to you know is to our clients, but also to the past. But very importantly, is also to the future mm-hmm. for people and good architecture. Hopefully, you know that we, we shouldn't be you know designing for thirty year life cycles is just something we shouldn't be thinking about anymore. We should be building for you know things that will outlive ourselves, outlive our clients' ambitions. So our role isn't just to diagnose the here and now, but it's to think and try and work out how on earth we can protect anything we're doing for the next hundred, two hundred, three hundred years years beyond. And I think that's something that I'm. I'm very aware of in the work I'm doing, both as an academic, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a teacher, you know, teaching um, students to think not just about the three years of their degree or the five years of their 
and traditional training, but of how that they can equip themselves to go into the 21st century and make meaningful change to the profession as a mm-hmm. as a place that's going to really kind of as people as you know changing the face of this profession i think to think you know think for the future i suppose how do you balance this idea of slowing things down with the kind of perversity that we have in contemporary culture of wanting things done so quickly you know we we, we see and particularly in building we see bizarre things happening where it's cheaper to do things with lots of waste and and because it's fast mm-hmm. because it saves money and in architecture we've we've always got this kind of you know this this balance between the client's money our own allocated profit margins and budgets and ensuring that everyone get paid gets paid properly versus with this philosophy that on the surface of it can seem you know the opposite to efficiency, um, if you like. I, I don't think all projects are slow. And I think that's something that's kind of interesting. I think there are certain projects that need to be slow, slowly mm-hmm. thought through and done where, especially when you're working with communities that have to come to terms with the idea of the project or working on those positions, there are absolute times when that, where it's very good to go slowly through the project and to make it work. Um, there are certain times with certain commercial clients, for instance, who need something done quickly and you know have to work within their timeframes where you can still slow down in certain points to stop the you know, stop them making a rash decision in some sense. So I think, you know, and you know, I, I come back to that. I you know, sometimes I think it's important there are certain clients that you may not want to work with because they are not interested in that long term future plan. And I think mm. at that point there are, it's being brave enough to kind of stick to your guns of knowing the kind of the right, the clients that you feel it, you can build that relationship with that isn't, you know, I, I'm not, I, I'm, I think I get too, sometimes I can, for my own good, I can get too emotionally invested in projects because I, and in people. Um, and I think that being, being kind of caring about people is, is super important. And I really believe that I care about the client but also about the team in the office and the, mm-hmm. the kind of the, the, the whole collective process, the community involved, the kind of the names, the people I kind of want to, I, these names of these certain people will stay in my head and go, I want to make sure that I do a really great job. Let's say Claudia at Westminster Chapel, who's this guy who was in a wheelchair and making the whole project around accessibility, mm-hmm. meeting Claudia was something that we just knew we had to get right. We knew we had to get him in the front door of this building in an equitable sense, other than him taking 150 meter round trip to get into this building that was going into every Sunday. And everyone was saying, this can't be done. It's not possible that we, you know, we kept on driving to find the solution because we, I knew so, it was so important for me that Claudio and the team, for me and the team, that Claudio was going to be able to get into that building in a, in a way that every other person in the congregation could get into. Mm. And so, you know, I think, I, I think slow and care, the two things I think that come to my mind the whole time. How, how do you manage this slow and careful approach internally inside of the business um, so that it doesn't become, uh, you know, we've, we've heard of kind of Parkinson's principle where, you know, the amount of resource allocated to whatever task, you know, it all gets used up. And yeah. there, there might be this misunderstanding that this slow and careful approach means, you know, that we can take loads and loads of time on something, but then there's obviously the, the reality of well, we've right. got a, we've we've got a budget, you know, the client's paying a certain amount of money. Where do we? How do you? How are you discerning over where to invest the time, or how do you control, you know, time and manage manage that resource inside of the business? It's a really good point. We we tend to have a number of different projects working in kind of in projective processes, and I think the slow projects also means is the, some of the reasons some of these projects have been quite slow is because there's a lot of stopping and starting mm-hmm. for certain projects. So a certain project will, um, you know, could, could be going quite, quite quickly at one point, but then we'll stop for a while to let people consider the ideas or kind of raise more funding for a project. And at that point, you've got to have the second project that comes through that's kind of working out. So there's a lot of juggling, I think. Um, I think my life at the moment is full of juggling, in a sense. I've got juggling being a parent to two daughters and husband to my wife, but and practice and you know practice of you know juggling my team there, the eight people who work in the practice of the studio to 
you know the, the students and you know those those that I think there's I've got I'm, I'm really bad at juggling in real terms. I can't mm-hmm. juggle to save my life, but um, juggling in like actually, I think it's a really interesting art, and I think it's not something that is taught very well in architecture schools. That actually, I think one of the biggest skills you have to have as a kind of a person working in architecture in the, in, in the way forward is the ability to juggle things because you can go from having to do a concept design at one point to be doing technical design or sitting on site with someone else or you could be you know you could be having to you know talk to a planner and you know talk to a, planner, a conservation officer at the same time as having to you know talk to a developer about you know something else so i think the dexterity is probably maybe a better word than um mm. juggling but there's a kind of i think that's something that i think we um that we have to do and i think in fact answering your question i think it's about having we we tend to have a kind of a few projects going at each time and we tend to be able to somehow work around our time frame so that we're kind of always working we're also we're not trying to be the a big practice um, yeah i you know i have grown up in the in the architecture engineering industry my dad was an engineer um and i saw what big practice was like and was and at the beginning i think i thought that's what i wanted but as i've kind of got more mature um nice that still people call me young i think that's quite nice but um but i i kind of i i've realized that's not what i want i want to keep i want to have a hopefully a really good practice you know for doing really positive projects um for the kind of that make a difference to people's lives mm. and um and doing them really well rather than having a big office that has you know hundreds of people and you know basically spending my life going out and winning work yeah i want to get to the boss i want to really get into the nitty-gritty and listen and yeah learn and enjoy the relationships that you build through these kind of projects mm. What's the relationship with your studio and with teaching? So, um, so my role. So, I'm the lead, I'm the leader of the architecture and physical design cluster at UEL, so at University of London. So, I I have there are eighteen courses that I have underneath my wing, and I yep. lead the architecture courses in particular um, as well. But um, so, I'm I'm doing quite a lot of academia at present. But I have a team of people at the moment in the office. Pretty much, there's a hundred percent people that I've taught um, in the office. So, so it is a practice of people who have, have grown up. They've been with me for eight years, ten years now. So they're now qualified and other parts of that and position. But we have a real kind of we're very tight knit. We tend to people tend to join us and stay for quite a long time, which is lovely. And yeah. um, we are there's a lot of honesty about and trust about what we do. And I think people who are in this in the in the practice really believe they really believe in the projects we're working on and believe in the journey we're going on. And so we and they but they also then also have quite a lot of autonomy in that as well. So it's a kind of a more of a collective conversation and we're trying now to be, you know, more collaborative as a completely as a group, um, to talk about ideas. It's not it's not my idea that, you know, that has to be the idea that gets presented to the client. An idea can come from anyone in the practice, and I think that's something that I'm really proud of at the moment. Is the office is a, um, yeah, in a way that idea of teaching practice, where you know, in 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 medicine and in kind of kind of in kind of medical world, you have your teaching hospitals, and they're seen as centres of excellence. Mm. And you have your, and in a way, I'm, I think we've got a bit of a kind of that idea of a teaching practice, and hopefully that through that kind of symbiotic relationship between practice and research and then the real and then teaching we can kind of that the, the kind of triangle kind of makes us stronger in yeah. sense. We, we're able to you know an example with church house where we're, we're trialing a thing that hasn't been done before where we're coating with we're working with a company called cork soul which is a sprayed on cork application which is granules of cork which creates a four mil thick um, outer layer of a wall, um, and we're putting it onto the ceiling, and, and that's increasing the thermal, um, the kind of U value of, of, of this historic wall by thirty percent. But it's only we're only actually adding a formal thick layer. 
right. to the wall. So, and we're doing that with research, with my researchers at UEL, and looking at that with the Portsold team to kind of, to prove that what we're doing makes sense. You know, if we can find a way that we can increase the thermal resistance of the wall by 30%, utilizing new, new found materials, we, you know, this could be kind of genuinely important to the industry. Mm. And we have the research team. I've got an incredible uh, research institute, a sustainability research institute at UEL, who are looking at this. We've got acousticians looking at it from an acoustic point of view. I, I think it's kind of unique, and that doesn't cost a client anything. So it's offering a client the kind of the added benefit of, well, you're working with us. We bring with us these incredible, um, this kind of bolstered team that can, you know, and we'll think about it in that way. Yeah, we'll think about every project as a potential research question as a project, you know, as well as it being a purely, um, as well as obviously doing the right thing for the client and the right thing for the project. As an, as an educator with your students um, and as a practitioner actually running a business and you know, doing work and winning work and working with real clients, what are some of the things that you find are most important to kind of frame for young architects? And you know, there's been a lot of um, criticism, perhaps, of architectural education or certainly wanting to look at it in, in terms of, you know, how it's serving the industry. And there's lots of different arguments from, from academia of like, well, is, our, is the purpose of education to, you know, to create you know, box ready architects or is it more to do with a, a kind of framework of thinking which can be applied to all sorts of disciplines? From your perspective, what are some of the kind of key things that you're keen to kind of you know make that link between practice and and study for younger architects as in i think the purpose of education is absolutely not to create box ready um architects i, I think we architecture can't it's not something that can be taught i think mm -hmm. in a hundred percent i think what it is is what we can do in education is set a framework for someone to understand their own journey their own critical journey is you know, mm. to be internally critical of what they can produce to kind of make their work better, um, to question what good looks like. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and also I was going to say before, I was going to say the word that I was, I was thinking about was before lockdown, I'd have said resilience. Mm -hmm. But actually what I found in the past three years was there's huge inbuilt resilience in young people. The resilience of, is incredible, actually, what the students were doing. I, I don't think I could have done what my students did um, during lockdown. And so I don't think resilience is a huge, I think, it, I think it's to showcase and to promote their resilience to themselves, mm -hmm. students themselves, and to then make students realize that actually going out into that world, you have to be resilient. You know, you're not, you know, a lot of students um, will, um, go out and send out 10 CVs and not get any responses and think, oh, I can't do this. And yeah. to realize actually it maybe take 100 CVs now and more. And, you know, it's not about sending out the CV. It just may be the wrong time for someone. Um, and especially at UEL, so my at UEL, we have a university, we have the most incredible cohort of students. So 72% of our students come from minority backgrounds, 68% mm -hmm. of the first in their families go to university. So my job in UEL literally is to bridge academia and practice and to utilize, to try and help um, practitioners engage with the university and, and in hence meet our incredible students because mm -hmm. we've just got the most remarkable students in the, in the school. And you know, they really do, they really could. I, it's my total belief that these students are the people who will change the face of architecture for the better you know, yeah. through those processes. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of your international work. I know you've, you've worked in some fascinating places and in Saudi and, and in Russia. And, and these are these are places that don't come without their complications. Yeah, sure. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how how those projects came about and what your roles were and, and what were some of the learning experiences, you know, in terms of running a business and working with uh, in, in different yeah, like so we so we were the first when we first worked in the Middle East, we worked with a remarkable client um, out there, and, and the client had gone out to it was design a private house, 
And the client had gone out to a number of practices in the UK and we kind of pitched the practice. And I remember going to the pitch and again, there was this expectation we were going to come in with designs for this client's house. And I walked in and I, and I went, look, I met, I looked at the guy and this um, young gentleman and his wife, they were, they were a fairly, you know, young couple. And I said, I don't want to design a stereotype for you. I really want, I don't you know, I could come up, I could come up with a design for you and, but it would be because of where you came from and who you were and those things. So again, what I want to do is I can clear my diary. And if you want us to do this project, I want to spend a week getting to know you. So literally, if you're ready, um, I'm ready to follow you. I'm never in the world and I'll go spend a week with you. And I actually, we actually did that. And it was the most remarkable experience because we sat down and I realized all of the kind of, um, that it wasn't this, 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 this incredible client again was, you know, an amazing, you know, an amazing family. If I hadn't done that process of kind of engaging, getting to know the family, being on first name terms with the kids and his wife and, in, and, and himself, you know, we, you know, having that respect and thinking again about how do we design a house that was going to be a house when the kids were, let's say, you know, young children, how that house, which was going to take five, 10 years to build, what would that house be like for when they were teenagers and mm-hmm. to try and, you know, I, it was, so we, I don't think we've had a very normal experience working abroad because again, right. we've been working with individuals and working on kind of projects that again, have taken a very long time and, and have taken a lot of, quite a personal approach to it. Yeah. But we, but it's been, but it's, I found it fascinating. I found it fascinating working in Saudi, when I first went over, there was still the religious police on um, checking everything. And I saw the rapid change to a much more kind of tolerant, still a very, um, you know, a very re- religious um, country. But seeing the tolerance change mm-hmm. was quite amazing, actually. And watching over a period of, you know, five, six years, you know, that the change in pace of a country and the, the rapid pace was, was fascinating within it. and. Um, you know, helping that family hopefully have a house that they can pass down through the generations. Again, that client realized he wasn't really building a house for himself, he was building a house for his family in the future. Yeah. And that was a really, you know, we did things, that instead of, we managed to do some things like not get into, you know, like a lot of the houses we'd seen where, where they'd taken half a mountain in Italy and moved it to Saudi Arabia. We made a house out of Saudi, you know, out of local building materials using, you know, using kind of, Precast concrete that was made in Saudi Arabia using materials from Saudi Arabia. So we were able to kind of think about the project from a sustainable, um, you know, vantage point, I suppose, which was really, um, yeah, which was really powerful. And you were also working in Doha. Yeah. So we won, we won the Doha Design Prize, um, which was British Council funded. It was a, again a, a residency where we um, went there for 10 days and actually worked with, um, People, people who were living in Doha or young kind of architects and in our case, archaeologists who were living in, living in Doha. And there were a team of, kind of from the UK who came out to partner with them. And we were asked to look at a particular part of Doha, a kind of, kind of a, a kind of more kind of not one of the glitzy bits of Doha in, in essence and look at how we could improve Doha and how we could improve the streets that escape of Doha. So we kind of came up with this idea of a city of play that basically was about the idea that you could, that a good city is a place where you see children playing on the streets. So how could we help? How could we stop Doha being a place that was full of cars and make it, and parking in essence, and turn the P for parking into the P for play? So how could we, you know, make it a place where kids were playing on the streets or in, in places again? And that, actually manifested itself into a installation we made, which was a, a maze, which was made out of palm leaves um, um, that we created a kind of children's maze in Doha and got what was really lovely, got kind of Qatari and, and kind of other Emirati and emigrant em, em, parents and their children mm-hmm. to play together in this maze, mostly because the parents were looking to try and find their children who they thought were lost in the maze, but you know, they, they had to go into the maze anyway. So that's <laughs> quite fun. <laughs> Love it, love it. In in terms of um, kind of coming back to 
uh, a project like the Jubilee Pool and this idea of deep listening. Um, would you better walk us through a little bit about some of the kind of residency that you might have done on that particular project? This is one that has, you know, it's won quite a few, uh, a lot of attention recently, and it's a beautiful project. Um, what was the part of the, the listening process, if you like, that you went through with that? That's, yeah, and that's for me, this project, I, I can rarely talk about this project without actually almost without crying for a number mm. of reasons. And um, my, so my, my wife's, um, wife's, my wife's mother's family are from Penzance. Right. And they have grown, grown up there. And even to the point that my wife's grandmother learned to swim in the GB pool when it first opened in 1935. Oh, wow. And so... I'd known about the project I'd actually, and I'd swum in it, um, going down the, um, going down with my wife's family before. And my wife's mum learned to swim in the Jubilee pool too. And so Penzance wasn't a place that was strange to me. And actually West Cornwall, West Penwith, which is not, this is, they call it West, West Penwith, which is where Penzance is. It's, you know, is a remarkable part of the world. It's super beautiful. It's, the light really is different down there because you get the light bouncing off the Atlantic Ocean and the English Channel across this kind of very, very tight kind of, you know, 10 mile strip of land that comes down to the end and land, down to Land's End. And so we were, um, so it was a very special place to me. And again, we were recommended to, um, by an amazing, another amazing lady called Pat Brown, Fisher Brown, who's this in, just, uh, one of the, the most, and generous people I've ever come across in the built environment. And her, her job is basically to help um, people kind of kind of find and connect people together, whether it's, um, you know, she did this with Central St. Martins and Argent with the move to King's Cross. You know, she was the, you know, and she's very, doesn't get talked about a lot, but she's a remarkable lady. And she, she knew that I had fam a family connection down there and I think was, they were looking, they were trying to find the right practice to look at this work. It's projects that lots of people had ideas about how the work could happen. And we, um, so we were introduced to the project and um, it was kind of a wonderful, you know, opportunity to kind of almost give, give something back to my, you know, both to a place that was very powerful, special to me, but also to my, you know, to my wife's family as a kind of, you know, and to engage in a place that was so important for her. So it was almost like a wedding gift in some ways. Um, but we, it was again, a, a, one of those, a long kind of conversation about, you know, what was the right approach for Penzance. And there, and there, there was an incredible group of uh, client group, um, including a, an amazing graphic designer called Martin Nixon, has this practice called Nixon Design, um, and Susan Stewart and Ginny Rowe. There's a group of people who were really engaged in making, looking, doing the right thing for Penzance. And um, Martin's brother had had this idea of using geothermal energy, because um, you know that part of Cornwall is one of the most geothermally active areas, to kind of heat the pool. And so he had had this idea, and you know they'd been talking about it, and we were brought in to kind of help vision that first idea of you know what would happen if the pool would um, could be heated. How could it become a kind of blue lagoon kind of yeah. idea? Um, we re realized fairly quickly that you couldn't get enough heat to, to heat such a huge pool. Um, so we, we could work out, we could make a smaller part work and that was, you know, that would be, um, that would be good enough in, in that position. And we just, um, again, it wasn't really the community bought into it almost instantly. The community realized the, the value of this, which was to create a space that was otherwise only open from kind of, end of you know the may the may bank holiday weekend until october and the idea that you could then heat a pair of this pool and you know by the way may to october this pool is still not warm it's not like you know you jump in and um kind of go oh this is a lovely temperature like we, <laughs> and i literally did this with the aj awards jury who i got to jump into the you know i got them in the cold pool and i'll and i can i can tell you that i've never seen judges i think react more um in kind of they definitely reacted really well to the warm stuff that's what you could definitely say about what their reaction was but in the cold bit there was a there was definitely a good feeling of that when they came down but um the difference and you know so we 
so they they the community really understood the need for this and the the idea that you could create something that would then bring more people down over the you know for a year round benefit um and you know there was the constraints of the listed building and the kind of the process of that and we we had to start off by kind of really understanding and unpicking what had been added and what was what was new and what was kind of old in in essence what was original and so we kind of went into the research of how the pool came about the story of um what was on on the spaces and then kind of delicately unpicked those bits that had been added erroneously almost in, in some sense and then tried to work out how we could create a new structure over to kind of bridge the old and the new and not and not feel too showy in in a way our the pool was the beauty uh, yeah. the, the new architecture that we did we just it was almost it, i quite like the fact that there are people don't show too many photos of it because it's all about what the pool and the space you know our architecture is ancillary to people's views of the this beautiful sunlight this um amazing structure that was you know built by uh, Frank Latham, who was this mm. kind of, you know, borough engineer who just got obsessed with how waves, how to break waves. So he designed the whole structure to break a wave. And, you know, our job was to sit back and just allow the pool in the water to do to do, do its job. In essence. Yeah. And to make some kind of sensitive, hopefully, you know, you know, positive interventions um, on the space, but they could also provide light and views. So I suppose that was where it came about and it was really lovely my um osman who's my one of the associates in the practice he went was down with um and another award jury um just before christmas um which has been um, up, on, up on the kind of on the awards for the McE rba journal McEwen award and um it, he went that's it's amazing it's full the pool's full the cafe's full everything you know and just for me to think that that's a place that Previously, there was no one was going down at the winter. No one was going down the midwinter. No one was going down to visit really that space. And now the space is buzzing, not just with visitors, but also with the community using it. Mm -hmm. um, it's so is really kind of so heartening that it's it's kind of taken its own life, and people are wanting to see it and be part of that journey. And hopefully, kind of through that love which was there from the local community and people who visited Penzance more people will love it. And then, you know, we only, buildings only survive because people love them. And so how can we, I hope that, you know, that project, you know, continues to kind of, kind of be a place that people kind of learn to swim in. My, weirdly during lockdown, um, we went down just as the pool had opened and we're in the, in the warm bit. And my daughter, Freya, who's like, who's four, or that time was three, she took her first independent strokes to her grandmother in that pool wow and that was like and that kind of that that, that says it all in what architecture can do especially when yeah. you're working with spaces of time mm -hmm. beautiful beautiful very inspiring um what's um this year got planned for you guys well we this year we've just we've just finished westminster chapel which is this project down in the heart next to victoria station um a one and a half thousand seater uh greatly listed auditorium uh, very much community led project which is really exciting we had that they had their first carol service um at christmas and with with this organ which is as good as the organ in the royal albert hall and that building is now opened up and uh really looking forward to kind of sharing that building with people and i think it, for the london festival of architecture we'll be doing a series of events in the space kind of collaborating with the university of east london bringing people from all over the UK actually together to kind of think about some in, something in common in that space and think about what architecture could be in the, in the future. I'll definitely make sure you get invited. Awesome. <laughs> um, and the real thing that we're working on right now is the church house in Westminster, um, which is a, again, a great two listed um, building um, on Dean's yard and on Great Smith street. It's a old block of Westminster and it's the building that, the United Nations was founded in, and uh, wow. the and Churchill speaks about when he says, um, "First we shape our buildings, then they shape us," because it's the building where the church house has this incredible circular um, kind of auditorium or kind of 
councils have changed space, which is where Synod happens, um, which is the Church of England's kind of main governing um, body meeting. And he was one, he was very keen that, you know, Westminster, the Palace of Westminster, after the bombing that happened during the war, didn't have a circular debating chamber because he was worried about the kind of style of debate that would happen in the, in the space. Mm. And um, actually, the Parliament moved to, to Westminster, to Westminster, sorry, to the Church House, Westminster, um, during the war as well, as it kind of as it had the, the room. So that's a project where we are looking to kind of make a, a hyper low carbon refurbishment of a greater visit building. At the moment, the numbers we're looking at are about we're, we're looking to embody a thousand tons of carbon through specification choice alone. So wow. we've, we've managed again and working with. The national churches institutions and, and, and again an incredible client body um have really kind of made the, some series of right decisions about the building about thinking about it for the future um they you know the church the church house team itself it's its own independently own uh, you know own the charity have made some really kind of very um positive decisions about material choices about you know not using as, as where possible plaster plaster board and materials that can't be recycled. So actually, we're putting down on on the floor of the office built of these office spaces commercially a commercial grade um, cork floor that's made out of recycled cork bottle tops, um, and it's kind of super hard wearing. And that's going to be and it, it's, it's all signs are looking really positive in that the first phase of which will be opening in the next couple of next few weeks actually and the and a client and a kind of a tenant will be moving in very very soon into that space Brilliant. so that's one that's yeah that's the that's the main bit of the practice we're looking at in the school it's about really opening ourselves back up to both our alumni we've got some incredible alumni who were at part of the university of london in the past and kind of opening our eyes back out to them to welcome back into the school but also reaching out to the profession and saying we've got these incredible students and we want you to meet them and come see their incredible work and kind of shout about the kind of the, the, the kind of these students and what they can what they can do it's amazing brilliant i think it's a perfect place to conclude the conversation alex thank you so much for sharing your expertise and and wisdom there in, and they've given us a little glimpse inside of your studio Rian, thank you very much indeed. It was a great pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.